Amen. Congregation, would you please stand? Would you take your hymnals and would you open to number 255? We'll be singing down at the cross. Please stand. Thank you. Please be seated. Okay, by way of announcement, I'm sorry we got started a little late, but uh, with the coronavirus and all that's going on all over the country and all over the world, the council wanted to meet and kind of discuss what the game plan was going forward, so I'm going to share that with you now. Uh, after worship service today, uh, there will be no church activities uh, for the rest of this week, no worship service next Sunday, which I believe is the 29th, and then we will reevaluate uh, when we get toward the end of that next week. So uh, Holy Week is coming up soon, April 6th, so we'll do a reevaluation at that time and see whether we feel like we should resume schedule or not. Um, so that would be all, all activities at the church. Unfortunately, we're going to have to cancel our celebrating our church heritage dinner and bake sale, uh, but we'll try to reschedule that in the future at some point. Uh, that's an important function and an enjoyable function for everyone, so we'll try to try to get that back in, in the schedule again at some point. Uh, but for now, that'll have to be, be canceled. Uh, do we have any birthdays today? Brittany had a birthday? When was that? A couple of nights ago, okay. Yeah, yeah, the Eddieite had a birthday there. Yep. Anyone else? Well, if not, then let's sing Happy Birthday, Dear Friends. 
Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear friends. Happy birthday to you. There was a minister, and he'd parked his car in a no parking zone in a very large city, and he was short of time, and he couldn't find a place that had a meter. And so he put a note on his windshield wiper that read this. I have circled the block ten times. If I don't park here, I'll miss my appointment. And scripture says, forgive us our trespasses. When the pastor returned from his appointment, he found a citation from a police officer with this note attached. I have circled this block for ten years. If I don't give you a ticket, I'll lose my job. Scripture says, Lead us not into temptation. (laughs) Uh, Pretty smart police officer there. Okay, let us stand for our praise song, Worthy is the Lamb. What? Can we switch that one? That's too hard. That one's too hard? What do you want to do instead? Something from the hymnal? 226 from the hymnal. 226? Yeah. Okay, we're going to make a change. Number 226 in the hymnal instead. Let's, Let's stand, please. loves me this I know for the Bible tells me so little ones to him belong they are weak but he is strong yes Jesus loves me yes Jesus loves me yes Jesus loves me the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, he who died, heaven's gate to open wide. He will wash away my sin, let his little child come in. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Let's take this heart of mine, make it pure and holy thine. On the cross you died for me, I will try to live for thee. Yes, Jesus loves me. Please be seated. I have one other thing I need to say that I didn't say during the announcements. Um, You know, currently each Sunday we broadcast live here from the church to the Elmcrest Manor through closed circuit cable television. And so uh, even though we won't be meeting as a congregation for worship, we will continue to uh, broadcast up at the Elmcrest Manor for those of you that are listening not right now from Elmcrest. Also, the other thing we will do is we will take the the DVD disc uh, as we have been doing each week. Uh, and so I will give a, a sermon and a prayer each week, even though there will be no congregation. And then we will take that and we will put it uh, onto the church website and onto YouTube. So if you wish to uh, listen to the sermon and the prayers, uh, you can still do that, even though we won't be meeting here for worship. Um, let's see, a time of fellowship. Well, we, we, can, uh, we can chat a little bit if you feel comfortable. I don't think handshaking is a good idea, but let's mingle a little bit. If you're comfortable with that, you can always do an arm bump. <laughs>
Well, since we don't have a choir and a choir anthem today, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, let someone from the congregation pick a number, and um, we, we'll, we'll sing that if you give us the page number uh, as long as I know it. <laughs> if I don't know it, I'm not going to lead it. So uh, maybe we'll sing uh, a couple of hymns, just the first couple of stanzas. That way we can pick two rather than just one. And when you have a selection, one they'd like us to sing? 256? Let's see, what, what is that one? The Old Rugged Cross, we all know that one. Number 256, the Old Rugged Cross. You can remain seated. Yeah, we'll do the first and the second verse. How about another selection, please? What is 96? Okay. Uh, we'll give it a shot. I'm not all that familiar with that, but a little bit. We'll try it. Touch 
Thank you, congregation. Let's be in a spirit of prayer at this time. Father God, as we come to you, obviously the, the biggest thing, the most pressing thing on all our hearts and minds is this coronavirus. And so we do ask that you would help us, not only here in America, but all across the world, that you would touch those who have been afflicted with it and other things as well that you would give wisdom and discernment to all of the, the medical personnel, the researchers, doctors, nurses, caregivers of various kinds, that you would keep them healthy, and that you would give them compassion for those who have been afflicted. We especially ask for your healing power to be released throughout our nation and throughout our world. We ask this all in your Son's name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. O oh God. We confess that sometimes we are part of a culture that seems numb to debt. It is hard for us in another level in the spiritual sense to acknowledge our debt to you. We get captivated by our day-to-day -day activities that we find it difficult sometimes to look at the long haul. And so we give these gifts this morning in the prayer that our giving is helping us to gain perspective on those things that are really important in life. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. rise. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, be seated.
Turn with me, if you would, please, to the book of Exodus, chapter 20. We're going to be reading verse 13. We're continuing this sermon series on the Ten Commandments. Today's verse is very short, verse 13. Are we all there? Page 54? Or whatever page you're on if you're reading from a Bible that is other than the blue one in the pew rack. Exodus 20, verse 13. You shall not murder. If we were to paraphrase Exodus 20, 13 in the Hebrew language, verse 13 would simply have this meaning, no killing. That's pretty simple and straightforward, no killing. In English, in the NIV, it translates, you shall not murder. And I would like to suggest to you that of all of the Ten Commandments, this is the one that is the most misunderstood as well as misapplied of all of the Ten Commandments that we have. It's talking about a lot more than just physical murder or premeditated murder in this verse, as we'll see as we get into this sermon. And in fact, I've talked with people who have actually tried to justify things that are the exact opposite of what Scripture teaches in this regard. There are some things that this verse does not apply to, that it does not mean. For example, this verse does not mean that it is wrong to kill animals. I've had vegetarians and other people tell me it is wrong to kill animals. Well, if that were the case, then how come in that same Exodus chapter 20 and verse 24, the Lord gives instructions on what to do for the sacrifice of animals? So clearly, and so many other places in the Old and New Testament, this has nothing to do with killing animals. That's not what the verse means. This verse does not condemn capital punishment, regardless of how you feel about that particular issue, this particular verse does not condemn capital punishment. Exodus chapter 21 and verse 12 says this, anyone who strikes a man and kills him shall surely be put to death. So it's not a condemnation of capital punishment. It doesn't justify pacifism to say that it is wrong to go to war, that it is wrong to fight. It doesn't prohibit self-defense, protecting yourself. Well, what is this commandment really all about? I would like to suggest to you that we look at it in a slightly different way this morning and understand that this commandment is really about life. It's really about pro-life. Why is it that human life your life and my life has value. What does the Bible tell us about life, and what does it tell us in terms of human life having value, and and why does human life have value if it does? Why is it wrong to murder? And by murder, I'm talking about a premeditated kind of situation. Well, Well, if it's not wrong to kill animals, then why is it wrong to kill human beings? Is there a difference? Scripturally, there is. Because there is a value to human life that is not attributed to the animal kingdom. Your life as an individual and my life as an individual and all human life has value. And the only reason that our human life has value is because God gives it value. That's the only reason, ultimately, when you get around to it. Because God has created your life and my life, that's what gives it value. All human beings. So your life has value because God has created human life. In Genesis 1.26 it says, let us make man in our image. Now never does the Bible say that God created the animal kingdom in his image. Only human beings. The Bible says God created man in his image, and in Genesis 2-7 it says, 
The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Or if you're reading from the King James, instead of the word being, it says a living soul. Contrary to what evolutionists say, the Bible says that God, that man is not here by random chance process. He is here by God's sovereign choice. We're not just a blob of protoplasm that came, has a network of veins that flow through our blood and through our corpuscles. The Bible says that we are a living being or a living soul that is created in the image of God, and that's what gives human life value. Man is not some form of an animal, neither is an animal a lower form of man. Man is the highest unique creation within the sovereignty of God. In my opinion, history will look back and will say that the greatest shift that occurred in human thinking occurred in the 20th century. And that was the shift in the way that man views human life. Who would ever dreamed back in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, or even 80s that we would have a person like a Dr. Jack Kevorkian, for those of you that remember him? His mission in life was to help people die, to take human life. He called them mercy killings. There are no manuals in our libraries and in our stores that tell you how to commit suicide and take your own life. At least that used to be the case, but of course that's not the case anymore. Human life has value. We are not to take it. Why is it that we don't view human life the way that we used to? I think we can sum it up in one word. Evolution. It's really that simple. The teaching of evolution. You see, if you teach your children and you teach your fellow human beings that we come from animals, then eventually we're going to start acting like animals because we don't value human life as something sacred and coming from God. People will start acting like animals. Someone once said this, and I quote, In the 18th century, the Bible was killed by liberalism. In the 19th century, God was killed by evolution, and in the 20th century, man was killed by both. So human life has value because God created human life, but human life also has value because God conceives human life. God conceives human life. The, the issue that people always ask is, as well, when, when does life begin? And that's an important question, I think, to wrestle with, but there's an even more important question than that, and that is this. Who begins human life? That's the ultimate question. Not when, who. Who begins human life? Well, we say, well, we biologically, we know how that happens. That happens through sexual intercourse, and, and then you conceive, Right? Well, that may be correct biologically, but that's not how it works theologically. Turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles to Ruth, chapter 4 and verse 13, page 190. Page 190, if you're reading from the Blue Bible in front of you. And I want to show you that Scripture clearly teaches that it is God who conceives human life. He is the one who begins human life. Are you with me? Ruth chapter 4, starting at verse 13. It says, So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. Then he went into her, and the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. There it is. It is the Lord who gives life. It is the Lord who allows people to conceive and have children. That addresses that question of who begins 
human life. The Lord does. It's not just a biological thing. It's also, if you will, a theological thing. Life begins at conception. Now, if you have any question about that, you just jot this verse down. I'll read it. You don't need to turn there. But Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5. This is God speaking directly to Jeremiah. And here's what he says to Jeremiah. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Do you get the significance of what that's saying? What that verse is saying is that before conception, at conception, and after conception, God was there the whole time. That's what that verse is saying. Before conception, at conception, and after conception, God was there the whole time. It is God who conceives human life. And then we have value as human beings because God controls human life. God controls human life. You see, when a murder is committed, ultimately you're denying the sovereignty of God and the dignity of man. The Bible says that there is only one being in this universe that has the right to control life and death, and that is God. In 1 Samuel 2.6, it says, The Lord brings death and makes alive. He brings down to the grave, and he rises up. You say, well, how is it that many scientists, and not all of them, and evolutionists are, are so eager to get rid of God? You know why? Because if you get rid of God, you can control life and you can control death. At least, that's what they seem to think. If you can get rid of God, you can control life, and you can control death. If you can get rid of God, you can control destiny. But you see, if God controls life, he's the only one that can control both life and death. All right, let's shift gears just for just a little bit here. And let's look at ways that you can kill, ways that you can commit murder, if you will. We've already said that life is a creation of God. Now, first you can kill by your actions. You can kill by your actions. This commandment prohibits directly murdering anyone. I'm talking about premeditated murder meditated murder here, not other things. This commandment prohibits homicide. We are not to take the life of an innocent human being. Homicide is the unlawful, unethical, unbiblical taking of human life. That's what homicide is. And unfortunately, and I think we all know this, that America, over the years and over the decades, has become very high up on the list of all the countries of the world for murder statistics. Let me give you some statistics. These are uh, from the FBI uh, 2018. 2018, there were 16,214 murders in the United States. That comes down to 5.0 murders per 100,000 people. Now, since I like sports, I like to think of it in that way. So I try to picture in my mind a sports stadium with 100,000 people in it. Of that 100,000 people at that sports stadium, five of them in the United States are going to be murdered. You can kill by your actions. And then there's suicide. This commandment is against, it prohibits Suicide. Suicide is simply self-murder. That's what it is. Suicide is self-murder. Here's some statistics about suicide. Again, in 2018, there were 48,344 Americans who died by suicide. There are an estimated 1,400,000 attempts that were unsuccessful. In 2018, the suicide rate was 14.2 per 
per 100,000 people. So again, if you've got 100,000 people in a sports stadium, 14.2 of those people committed suicide. And I would like to suggest to you that actually these numbers for both murder and suicide are a lot higher than the numbers that I'm giving you. Why? Let's say a person goes and they consume alcohol and they're drunk and they drive and they kill themselves. May not have been intentional, but they've committed suicide. So those numbers for suicide could go way up. Or maybe a person was drunk driving or, or abusing some other kind of, of a drug and they go out and they, with their vehicle, they kill someone else besides themselves. I'd suggest they've committed murder. Now, technically, under the law, I get it. It's involuntary manslaughter, but they've committed a murder. So those statistics, really, when you get right down to it, are a lot higher than the official statistics that our federal government puts out. Suicide is self-delusional and self-deceptive. Suicide never rights a wrong. It never pays a bill. It never solves a problem. It never restores a marriage. It never glorifies God. But you leave all that problem behind to your family. How does a family look at that? It's never going to help the children who say, was it something that I did that my mom or dad committed suicide? It will never help the mother or father who say, was it something that I did or did not do that my son or daughter committed suicide? People ask, well, if a Christian commits suicide, do they go to heaven? Yes. I believe they do. They go to heaven. But suicide is a form of murder. It's a premature death. It's an immature, if you will, death. And then finally, this morning, there's one other kind of murder that I want to talk about, and that is feticide. Feticide is a form of murder. It is the killing of unborn children. Now, I know this is an extremely controversial and complicated subject, and I'm aware of that up front. But I'm going to just tell you what I believe Scripture has to say about that matter. The Bible teaches that feticide or abortion is a form of murder because it is the taking of a human life. A human life. That's very important. You see, if abortion is not the taking of an unborn human life, then it's no more evil to take a fetus out of the womb than it is to remove a ruptured appendix. So for abortion to be wrong, you must first believe that it is the taking of human life. And that's why those that are pro-choice and pro-abortion want to tell you that it's, it's not a human life. It's just a bunch of cells or other things. But scripture teaches that life begins at conception. It is the taking of human life. You say, well, isn't that just your opinion as a pastor? No, I'm not alone. There are some genetic experts who believe that human life starts at conception. One of those is Dr. Jerome Lejeune. He is the professor of fundamental genetics at the University of Paris. And he is the one that actually discovered the genetic basis for Down syndrome. Here's what he had to say on the subject. Life has a very long, long history, but each individual has a very neat beginning, the moment of conception. To accept the fact that after fertilization has taken place, a new human being has come into being is no longer a matter of taste or opinion. The human nature of the human being from conception to old age is not a metaphysical contention. It is plain experimental evidence. End of quote. Another doctor said this, Dr. Michelin Matthews Roth, a principal research associate in the Department of Medicine at Harvard University. Here's what he said on the subject. It is an accepted fact that the life of any individual organism produced by sexual reproduction begins at conception or fertilization, the time when the egg cell from the female and the sperm cell from the male join to form a new single-cell zygote. Quote. 
Now what the doctor said is, and these two renowned doctors, world experts said that there is no doubt that life begins at conception. And if you believe, truly believe that life begins at conception, then we have to be able to say in accordance with this commandment that feticide is murder. And then we'll stop here and continue with, with uh, next Sunday. I guess you'll have to watch it on the computer. <laughs> Would you please take your hymnals open to number 118? We'll be singing, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Please stand. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he Amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing, for still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe, his craft and power are great, and armed with cruel hate. On earth is not is equal. Did we in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. Were not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing? Ask who that may be, Christ Jesus, it is he, Lord Sabaoth his name, from age to age the same, and he must win the battle, and though this world with devils threaten to undo us. We will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. Let us pray. Father God, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for your word, for the commandments that you give us as the guide for our life, so that we might live them in a way that is pleasing to you. Be with us now as we go our separate ways. Watch over everyone, protect them, bring healing where it is needed. In Jesus' name, amen.